Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we are about to start the webinar now and uh, we are lucky to have a, a guest speaker. Our first guest speaker uh, is here already and uh, as we are waiting for others to join, of course we are about seven minutes beyond above the uh, scheduled time. So I would uh, plead uh, with our speaker for uh, starting out late, uh, we are very sorry about that. And for those who are just joining us, you have not made a mistake. You have not made a mistake. In fact, you have just joined uh, the grand finale of the Global Scholarship Opportunities Program of the Nigerian Student Association, KNU Chapter, which is, this, uh, is an association founded uh, founded by uh, the Nigerian student here in KNU in South Korea, Kyungpuk National University. And our goal with this webinar is to enlighten a lot of people out there, especially in Nigeria, on the pros and cons of seeking admission into universities outside Nigeria. And uh, we've been doing this for quite a long time. And this is also an, ad an addition. And also for this year's uh, orientation program, this is going to be the grand finale program. So, and uh, we are very glad to have our guest speaker here. Uh, we are, will be having two speakers today. And our first guest speaker is no other person than uh, Professor Salifu Emmanuel. Uh, and these, uh, uh, outstanding individual is a very, very outstanding. If you go online to check his LinkedIn profile, you'd be amazed with what he has done so far in terms of research. Uh, I will do a little bit of introduction to read his bio, his short bio. And uh, for those who do not know him, he's an expert in the development of a range of biogeotechnical solutions for soil improvement. He has a master's degree in environmental engineering from the University of Strathclyde, Glasgow, UK, and a bachelor in uh, agricultural and environmental engineering for, from our very own university in Nigeria, University of Agriculture, Makodi in Nigeria. It is from this university, University of Agriculture in Makodi, that he started his work on groundwater monitoring and water quality assessment. So, for every uh, high achievement that we are having in life, of course, we will start from a very, very, from somewhere. So it was from the University of Makodi that he began his study in biogeotechnical solutions that he's an expert in right now. So he also has a dual PhD from the University of Strathclyde in the UK. I'm not sure I pronounced that correctly. And the University of Naples, Federico II in Italy. And, uh, Dr. Emmanuel he is a well-seasoned uh, lecturer. Uh, he started his lecturing uh, activities, lecturing work from the University of Agriculture in Makodi, where his responsibility encompasses teaching, research, and extension activities. So he has so many fellows on his cap, So, but I am very sure that if I keep on reading, every one of us will be intrigued that, oh, I want to be like a resource person today. So without wasting much of our time, and uh, because we've spent much time already, so I would, I would uh, uh, give the um, uh, how would I put it, the invincible microphone. I would hand over the invincible microphone to our resource person today, who will be speaking to us on the exploring postdoctoral research opportunities in UK and US. Exploring postdoctoral opportunities in UK and US. Over to you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much, um, Fat Jimmy. I'm sorry, Fat Jimmy, right? I guess that's correct. Thank you. I really appreciate that uh, introduction. And I'm very happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me um, to speak. I didn't know this was the grand finale. I just uh, realized that on the program. And I hope we end it on a very, uh, very great note. I really appreciate this. Um, when I was invited, I'll try to share my screen while I'm talking. Right. When I was invited uh, by uh, a colleague, Kadri, I was wondering what I was going to talk about because I felt uh, 
you know, experiences vary and my own journey has been a bit of not uh, very conventional or typical. And so uh, what he said, just talk about your experience and share whatever you have. And so I have just a few slides to go through, but I would expect to have more engagements by questions and interactions, and then probably we'll be able to talk more in a more relaxed uh, mood. I also understand that it's very late for you guys right now, and uh, a lot of people might be wanting to go to bed. So we'll try our best to keep it really short, and hopefully it's engaging enough for us, uh, and at the end, you'll be able to get one or two things out of it. Uh, please confirm if you can see my screen and hear me clearly. Yes, yes, we can see okay. the screen and hear clearly, so. Right. So uh, I'm going to just skip this slide now because uh, the moderator has basically said everything. I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that I had two experiences of being a postdoctoral um, research associate at the University of Strathclyde in the UK, 2019 to 2021. And um, uh, I was lucky to be a presidential postdoctoral fellow here at the Arizona State University uh, since 2021. And this should be ending by mid next week when I start as an um, assistant professor at the same university. Um, so I'll just be sharing more of my personal experiences um, through the whole postdoc work, postdoctoral work at the Strathclyde and here in the USA. And uh, the things I've picked up along the line. And like I said, I would expect that we get more interactions during the, the questions and answers because I'll probably not see everything uh, that you want to hear. I'll begin with this slide, you know, what, what is actually a postdoc? What is it about? And um, that's a meme there from an unknown source, but uh, they've tried to depict the postdoc as the mad scientist in the middle of everyone along the career pathway. You complete your bachelor degree, you're quite still happy and, you know, enjoying yourself through the way the masters a little bit eh, uh, for challenge uh, then there's a phd that actually makes you more boring and sad <laughs> it looks like from the face there and then the postdoc level everything escalates and you're this mad scientist who doesn't look like it fits into the environment who's basically crazy all the time and maybe he's doing great things or maybe also weird things somewhere there uh, along the pathway and then there's the cool PI who, who's been able to move through all of these positions and is now more accomplished and settled, it seems. And then at the end of it all, uh, become an emeritus professor who laughs at every stage and feels like, you know, it's been a worthwhile journey eventually. But we're talking about that, that crazy part, the postdoc. And um, the National Postdoctoral Association here in the USA defines a postdoc as an individual who holds a doctoral degree and is engaged in a temporary period of uh, mentored research. That means he has an advisor or scholarly training, sort of more independent, but trying to get some more skills for the purpose of acquiring professional skills uh, needed to pursue a career path of his or her choosing. Um, the idea of having a postdoc, or the word postdoc itself is basically postdoctoral. That's after the PhD. So every other thing one does after the PhD, ideally, should be what is called the postdoc. But I guess um, from Europe, uh, many years ago in the 1800s, they started this position sort of officially to help people continue to explore research, unmitigated, undisturbed, well-funded, and just get lost in research, be in the lab and you know discover things and do great things. That was the idea behind it initially. But with the, the growing population of the number of people who are graduating with PhDs, uh, there became a need to create it like an, like an office, like a position, which it actually is not. It's, it, the postdoc doesn't fit into the career pathway. The postdoc is, it was not meant to be a career position in the ideal sense. So there's no aiming to become a postdoc or as, as the end or, or something like that. It wasn't even meant to be a means to an end. It's just a, state, a status. After you complete your PhD, you're basically a postdoc and you should be doing other things. Become a professor, become a lecturer, uh, go ahead with working in industry or uh, entrepreneurship ventures, whatever you choose to do with uh, the PhD afterwards. But now, due to this increasing number of uh, PhD graduates 
and uh, probably in some cases unemployment, uh, especially in the academic field, because most PhDs want to fall into the academia. And ultimately, you can only uh, sort of replace one person of about 10 or more graduating people from one lab. Uh, you know, and that means that there's, there's more supply than the, there is availability for uh, academic jobs. And so you have to let people stay in a cooler somewhere after the PhD. And that's essentially what the postdoc does. But th there are different ways people refer to postdocs. Uh, a couple of them mean something more than what is generic. This is from uh, PhD comics. And uh, sometimes this helps to give some comic relief when you're going through some challenges with your PhD and maybe even a postdoc. But I've just put this slide here to emphasize that a lot of people misinterpret some of those terms, you know. Um, and the, 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 the table on the left is just showing the PhD comic guys trying to say that, you know, if you call it postdoc without a hyphen uh, with small letters, that's a lazy way of referring to it. And it goes on to describe all the other ones, the ones that are grammatically correct or sort of a German way. I don't know why they call that the German way. Uh, and then there's postdoctoral student. And that's the funny one. Some people actually still believe that postdocs are, are kind of students because they are confused as to how to categorize them. And that's not their fault. It's still because this position essentially uh, is not really in the career path. So one is not sure if the person is still a student or is independent or you know how to address them becomes a challenge. But yeah, you they can also be called postdoctoral staff in some places, uh, postdoctoral scholar, uh, postdoctoral scientists, and this is usually used in um, uh, national labs or sometimes in industry. Uh, postdoctoral researcher is the generic name. Postdoctoral research scholar is also very generic. Postdoctoral research associate is what um, usually is the appellation in the in the UK uh, for postdoctoral research associates. Sometimes they also say postdoctoral research assistant, or rather not no postdoctoral because research assistant is more like this person is about to complete their PhD, but they've got a role, a position that looks like a postdoc. So they just say, okay, it's a research assistant. Uh, so we will still add postdoctoral research assistant, although they, they may have not have gotten their certificate yet. And then there's the postdoctoral uh, research fellows. And this ones, which I'll talk about shortly as well, uh, kind of have their own funding. They are not really attached to a lab and working under a PI. They, they wrote proposals, got a grant or a fund to pursue independent research as they will, but they had to stay or be housed in a lab somewhere. And so they stay there. So they call them fellows, postdoctoral research fellows. And then there's the presidential postdoctoral fellow, which the US is creating in some of these institutions uh, in recent times. The idea is to basically uh, again, let people stay in the cooler for a while and then transition them into faculty positions. And so most post presidential postdoctoral fellowships are advertised with the intention of transitioning people directly to faculty position. All the other ones you see here are not exactly with the prospect of becoming faculty. It's just you're doing a postdoc, you're completing a project for a lab, or you're trying to use your grants. And at the end of it all, you still have to begin to hustle for the next thing to do. You know, but generally, post presidential postdoctoral fellows are hired like faculty in waiting uh, in some institutions to send them to other institutions to go just complete a year or two and then return to their institution as faculty and some other places they have them within the system and transition them and then there's clinical fellows who usually are, are related to the medical field uh, they're basically postdoctoral people who, who go in the medical field so i must emphasize here also that you know while it seems like the postdoc might not be a career pathway per se well defined i also uh, acknowledge that that might be in fields like engineering and some other fields, but in the sciences, in biology, in neurosciences, and, and all of that, uh, it's almost an essential pathway to faculty positions or leadership in research uh, at this point. So you hear of people who do postdocs for many years, who do postdocs in different places, and it's basically part of the, the movement for them. But some engineering uh, graduates complete their PhD and skip that process and go straight to become faculty. This happens a lot um, in, in some places. It happens certainly in the US and some parts of the UK as well. And there are probably different uh, reasons why that happens depending on accomplish accomplishments uh, during the PhD and um, availability of position that basically accepts 
what uh, one may have accomplished at that point. And so uh, the general characteristics of um, typical postdoctoral positions is just what I try to list here. First of all, just to say that there are about 70,000 uh, postdocs in, in the US as of 2021. And this number must have increased a lot more uh, in the past uh, two, two, two years. Uh, just to show that the, the, the number is also growing, you know, starting in the 1870s with just one or two people trying to do that and growing into a few thousands in the in the 90s. Uh, we are entering, inching slowly towards uh, 100,000 people in, in postdoctoral positions, which is basically a transient position, as it were. Uh, it's a bit of a cause for concern, but also uh, it would be great if there are benefits that come with it in terms of uh, uh, some things I would also list in the, in the next slides, probably. Typical postdocs usually go from one to five year duration. For those who it's a career pathway for them, they might go more. I've seen postdocs of eight to 10 years, uh, but the, the advice usually is to stay within maximum of two years kind of um, duration for a postdoc because it's a waiting position. And the more you stay really in certain fields, uh, the more you almost reduce your chances of moving to the next level of what you would want to, to get into, especially maybe academic role. Because there's many people graduating, and then whatever you're doing as postdoc is not exactly giving you all of those skills, essentially, uh, to become faculty. The more years you're spending there, it sounds like you're not embodying the other parts of the skill, especially if the postdoc is one-sided. By one-sided, I mean... If you look below that um, column there, they, they, there are postdocs that are about teaching and some or most are about research. You know, if it's one-sided and all you do is research, you're not embodying the, the, uh, the part of the skill set of teaching and leadership and mentoring. You know, it wouldn't be great to stay there for too long because you'll be literally jeopardizing chances of um, maybe getting a faculty role, for instance. But ultimately, uh, one to two years is, you know, the sweet spot for uh, cooling off after a PhD and trying to get on with the next stage. Uh, it's now becoming a de facto next career step post PhD. Ideally, it wasn't meant to be a career pathway, like I said, but uh, at this point, with 70,000 people or more uh, in position of postdocs at different years and people doing it over in one or two or more institutions uh, and for many more years, it's becoming something that looks of uh, an established uh, role. And so the question is always at the end of your PhD, you know, what are you thinking about for your postdoc? Where are you thinking to go for your postdoc? And so it's it's becoming part of the establishment. And so it's great that um, you guys are thinking about how to uh, uh, capitalize on the opportunities that uh, that might bring post PhD. Typically, uh, postdocs have a postdoctoral advisor or a mentor, uh, depending on the type of postdoc. You work under someone almost like it were as it were in the in the PhD. Uh, you'll be doing research a bit faster because you have more experience and a bit more confidence. And um, in some cases, the postdoctoral advisors are the ones who pay uh, your salary or they integrate into the university system for pay. Uh, in that case, you're coming on to an existing research project and they, they basically have a clear outline of what they want you to do, even though they would want you to bring some individual development plan on the board. Uh, but essentially, uh, the, the role is defined in that case, you're working with a mentor. Um, the timeline is also a bit clearer uh, and, and you know what you're working towards. It may also be that the, the, the mentor, the advisor needs someone to take some level of responsibility off of their shoulders and take leadership in that lab. And so the postdoc is also being groomed to uh, be a, a research leader in that sense, which is also a great thing to, to have and to do. And there are independent uh, postdocs who do independent research. Uh, essentially, those ones are like the postdoctoral fellows I mentioned who get their own funding. And again, just to emphasize here that it's supposed to be a temporary position to prepare for an academic position or some professional position later on. Uh, that's still what it is, uh, despite the circumstances around it uh, currently. So why do a postdoc? Uh, you may have also filtered that from all I've said so far, but essentially, um, one of the fundamental reasons is to bridge between the PhD and whatever is going to happen next. So you've been running through the PhD and too much focused maybe on your research and other PhD related challenges. Uh, and at the end of it all, it feels like, you know, you need to calm down, uh, settle down, plan the next steps. 
it ideally shouldn't be so but if it happens that way then you want to just go for a postdoc uh, where you have the opportunity to maybe publish more of the phd papers that you weren't able to bring out and then also understand how research is done somewhere else under someone else uh, and begin to map out a clearer and more concrete plan for for the next step it could also be to learn new and complex research skills so phd might not give us everything we need to be confident and ready for the next level and then you find out that there is this other lab that does something you almost touched on during your phd or you'll be really interested in getting to know before you move on to the next level uh, that's another good reason to you know do a postdoc stop by a little bit and, and and embody those skills before moving on it could also be to carry out research in a new area you had ideas that you know, before before and after your phd and um, you feel you're not quite in the space to go take up a faculty position and so it's like okay i still want to explore this idea i'm writing a grant to see if i can get money for it and, and still uh, push it a little bit and see how far it gets uh, that's a good reason to also uh, consider a phd to increase your research output in terms of uh, like i said earlier publishing from your phd work or uh, getting more papers uh, in the belt so that uh, you'll be much more ready for like a faculty position or getting more skill sets uh, some research output if you probably have been working on something that's patent worthy and you wanted to complete that um, uh, process or other things like that that would essentially still uh, beef up your cv and profile uh, and make you more competitive in the market for uh, whatever next role you're aiming to get and exactly what uh, i was saying shortly, uh, just now is what follows to improve your chances for tenure or permanent positions tenure track or tenure or, or permanent positions uh, in different institutions you want to get uh, the opportunity to do a postdoc and show you're active in research and uh, improving your chances for that and uh, more recently there are people who are basically just interested in moving around uh, you know see what it is on the other side whether you're motivated like uh, nigerians for the japa syndrome or just from the idea of um, moving to a different location migration change of location uh, could also contribute to that and it could also be due to family circumstances uh, you know uh, someone and their spouse or partner might have just completed a phd and one of them gets a position somewhere else yeah it could be another reason for the other person to move there and try to explore postdoctoral positions while uh, looking forward to something more permanent so essentially the feel here is that it's a temporary position uh, it's like a bridge between one and the other but the target is a more permanent position later on and one is just trying to upskill as it were or get more and more uh, of what is required for your profile to be ready for that permanent position and uh, this may have also been gleaned from what i've said so far there are different types apart from the names and how they refer to them it could also depend on the kind of funding type that that different postdocs get the ones on salary are usually working under a pi or you know based on the university's fundings the ones on stipends have their own funds they wrote grants uh, and they got funding or fellowships and they brought it to that lab or to that space to that university to that institution and they just get that space to to do their work there's also the nature of the, the postdoc type. Some are restricted, and this happens a lot in the UK, where you have to essentially, you're recruited into a project and you're working strictly on that project. Uh, you could get fellowships as well in the UK, um, and then you have some, you move to the level of having a bit of a broad nature of work. You determine your work plan, and what you want to achieve uh, with your funds. Uh, and uh, some are basically based on leadership. There's a project, we need someone to take leadership of this project, to mentor other people, to relieve the PI, and to grow themselves into a good leadership uh, position for whatever stage they're going into later on. And again, the project-specific one is just like the restricted one where you're recruited onto a project, uh, and that's it. You're basically focusing on just that project. You almost have no um, opportunity to explore other things within that period depending on how long it is and and that's basically all one gets so this this uh, nature of work affects how the postdoc functions essentially depending on the kind of project funding types that you work in and uh, there are different postdocs not just in academia in industry and in government now here in the us there are um, national laboratories that are funded by the federal government where people actually go to and, and work as postdocs and they do 
very intensive research. Um, they, they take leadership in research globally uh, and, and show great outputs. They could be there for even much longer than the one to five years we talked about. Uh, they grow to become uh, essentially good leaders in research. Most of them funnel back into the academia as uh, professors later on. And there are postdocs in industry, where industry is looking at uh, maybe joint postdoctoral positions with universities or um, trying to just have researchers in their R&D to uh, push certain projects out uh, of the door. Right, so going into the meat of the matter, uh, postdoctoral positions in the USA and, and exploring them, um, I was going to say essentially and end the talk by saying, you know, just go to Google and say postdocs in the US and you get all the links you need. End of talk, you know, but that's truly what it is. Uh, most of these links I've pulled out, you can find them online yourselves. Most people are very tech savvy these days, so it's not too difficult to search and get information. It's everywhere. Uh, but essentially, one of the things I want to highlight, and I would highlight much more at the end, is the idea that um, postdoctoral positions, and even now some PhD positions and, and, and um, other such roles, work more uh, through referrals. You know, we, we probably call it connections in Nigeria or something like that, but it's a bit of having to explore your network and uh, the opportunities within your network or network of networks, your extended networks. And it's much easier for people to make offers to people they know or people who they know who is referring them to um, come over to them just for the sake of some level of uh, confidence in what you are about to, to take control in the recruitment process to know that uh, you know what to expect rather than throwing uh, uh, sort of uh, casting into the dark to pick whatever you get essentially. A lot of people have had disappointments that way and have uh, basically resorting towards uh, asking for referrals. In some cases it's also that it, it, an area is so niche that it's difficult to put out an advertisement, publicize it greatly, and pull in the right persons. And so people go into their local networks and try to explore, uh, you know, that your PhD student, is it done with his PhD? Is he interested? Is she interested in, in a postdoc? I have one in my lab. I might be creating one next year and things like those kind of discussions go on a lot. And when you see positions advertised in some cases, it's to fulfill the formal requirements. And usually they just recruit from the uh, the, the referral and the personal networks and the extended networks. Uh, but still, there are those that still go out, a lot of them, a lot do. So this is not a discouragement from um, applying in general, but you know, go to those links and see positions that are advertised and if they um, sit well with your plan and desires, uh, it would be good to uh, send in an application. But in most cases, it's far more rewarding or probably prospective of uh, positive outcomes if you can reach out to the, the PI or the named person in charge of uh, the recruitment process. And it could be in research labs, uh, in government agencies, or they could just be PIs in their own labs, you know, professors, assistant professors, associate professors, full professors uh, who have some funding, whose group is growing larger, they need a postdoc to take leadership in some areas, they got the funding specifically to recruit postdocs and things like that. It would be uh, great to reach out personally to them via email. You could also be targeting certain uh, labs before you complete your PhD. You're beginning, you're beginning to know that these people work in my area of um, research. And uh, if I would get some position later on, it might be in these places, you know, then it becomes a good time to send some cold emails uh, and, and just hint them that you're completing your work. This is your research area. It's really interested in if they have positions available. Some actually advertise it uh, in their lab websites or in the universities. And so it's good to also explore the university websites, the career and jobs uh, area of most university websites, they advertise some of these postdocs. These links are li uh, listed here, and that's not exhaustive. Essentially, uh, the ones that pull together various postdoc advertisements from different places, uh, among others, to help you get a feel of uh, the jobs that are out there. You can filter them to specifics, to areas that will fit what you want, essentially but also you can go to research labs, government agencies, and uh, different uh, labs and universities to see what they have. If they are recruiting postdocs actively, they'll mention it there, even if it's not fully advertised, that yeah, you could reach out to the PI um, and, and, and get some emails. But referrals, um, I, I put it here in bold with uh, exclamation marks, just to say it's a very, very central path of how the process really works. 
in the postdoc uh, in the USA, the, there are visa types that people get, and this is something to consider. Not just being excited about moving to the US, for instance, it would be good to look at the kind of visa one is um, getting for that role because it's a temporary role and there's not so much commitment towards um, uh, keeping the fellow after the PhD and after the postdoc rather. And you're looking at what would happen afterwards in most cases. It's also sometimes it's good to just have uh, put a foot inside there and be able to explore ways to move ahead. But within the period of the postdoc, uh, a lot of people have come in and felt like, oh, I didn't know that this visa was this restrictive. I wouldn't have taken this position at all or something like that. So it's good to do your homework before making such decisions. And there are basically three categories of visas for postdocs in the US. There are PhD students who are on the F1 visa, sort of a student visa, uh, who after their PhD are given three years to do uh, OPT kind of uh, training afterwards. And this allows them to take up roles as postdocs or work in industry and so on. Uh, and then there are uh, J1, there's the J1 visa, which is the most popular one for postdocs. They're bringing you from another country, for instance, uh, to come in as like an exchange researcher. So essentially temporary and complete the project and then move on, move on, go back to your country uh, as it were. And then there's the H1B employee visa, which is probably the best way to come into the US as a postdoc if offered that kind of opportunity, because the H-1B is a dual intent visa, which means you can basically stay on in the in the US, apply for a green card, a permanent residency, and, and stay on that way. The other two visas are not that way, but you know you could transition to the H-1B uh, or apply for the national interest waiver visas while you are there to, to get some of those opportunities. So sometimes it's good to get a foot in. Uh, also, how you come in matters. This also matters greatly for uh, PhDs and postdocs who have spouses, because again, these visas uh, essentially renders the spouse unable to work immediately um, until they fulfill certain other requirements that may be complicated depending on uh, different stages of um, life and qualifications that uh, the spouse might have. So, and so family considerations come into play as well if you're thinking of exploring or moving into the USA for a uh, postdoc position. It's a temporary position, depending on the offer on the table, how does it uh, impact on family, if you have family. Uh, and then there's prospects after the postdoc. So you want to also consider, does this position, is it like a presidential postdoctoral fellow that ties you straight to transitioning into faculty? Essentially, in that case, the interview is more like a faculty level interview, or is it still a temporary um, uh, presidential uh, postdoctoral fellowship or postdoctoral um, funding? where at the end of the term, you basically on your own, you need to think about what to do next. Um, is the lab productive enough that you see prospects of maybe renewal of your contracts, which is not so great, but you know, will still keep you going until you get something later on. Uh, is it a place that you feel you will have opportunities to explore uh, other roles, other, other things around much more within the period and so move into uh, other things. And there's great opportunities in the US, I must say, for uh, immigrants like us, when you come in, there are jobs in many other parts of the industry and so on. But of course, it all boils down to visa sponsorship, if they are willing to do so. Um, and there are also faculty roles, different levels of faculty positions that one could explore uh, and pushing for. And then there's a lot about living in the US in general. You know, there are considerations. A lot of people think there's uh, gun violence everywhere on the streets, every part of the country which might not be true, uh, but there is the, uh, the problem of violence, uh, not just gun violence, a whole other kinds of uh, crimes, like every other place in the world, well, most other places in the world, um, it's, it's not too far away. The US has a large land mass and a huge population. And if you normalize all of these things to the population and the land mass, it might not be too far from what happens elsewhere. But essentially, those are things to also consider if one is comfortable uh, living in environments like that, uh, moving from wherever you are staying to that kind of situation. Uh, and basically the living costs as well in the US, the kinds of benefits that are available, health benefits uh, or not, uh, the type, the ranges uh, that are there. And so you get lots of paperwork in the US. I think it's probably much more bureaucratic in terms of paperwork and all of these uh, processes than the UK, which I'll talk about shortly. 
because there's a lot of things in the fine prints. There's a lot of things you have to really read through the lines to understand before signing a contract or moving into the US. Um, and there's lots of surprises even at that. Many of us share experiences and it's like, you know, I didn't know this part, I didn't uh, foresee this one and so on. All right, moving on to postdoc in the UK. Again, I've listed uh, some links from the general postdocs. In this case, I'll just probably talk briefly about some of them. Um, in the UK, there's this website, jobs.ac.uk, that basically is the go-to one-stop shop for advertisements for research positions of different kinds, from PhD to postdoc to faculty position, and it's very good to explore uh, that website. Similar to also the Times Higher Education.com uh, in terms of jobs in the United Kingdom, and uh, good old LinkedIn. I emphasize that as well in uh, the, the, the US links as well. On LinkedIn, you can basically see lots of uh, job postings in general. And uh, some other websites, there's the British Academy that actually advertises its own fellowships. This is, I think, for mostly uh, people in the arts and humanities. Uh, and there's the KTP program, where you have knowledge transfer partnerships, mostly between industry and the universities. Uh, it's a very well-defined program. It might be just to roll out certain patents or quickly uh, complete a part of the research to roll out an industry product and so on. But it, it's a pretty nice program to get on as well especially if you're considering the industry and academia side of things, the KTPs are great. Uh, there's findapostdoc.com, and there's the Maris Klodowska Curie Actions Fellowships, and this is probably the most prestigious, I think, of uh, postdoctoral fellowships across Europe. And there's opportunities to also um, move to the US as part of this postdoctoral fellowship. You know, you have a home base somewhere in the Europe, in Europe and another part of the project uh, can be done in the US or other parts of the world. Uh, it's changing because of Brexit, and so it might be good to look at the terms a lot more. But it's quite prestigious. The pay is way higher than even some uh, faculty positions in the UK, uh, and uh, they, they really take care of the postdoctoral fellows. It's a very great program to get on. Uh, but you need to write your grant proposal. You need to find a lab that would accept you, a uh, support letter from the PI. The procedure is a bit rigorous and uh, sometimes challenging. People drop out. But essentially, this uh, this is a very good one to get. Most people who complete this one uh, successfully uh, almost set for life in terms of academic pathway. And then there's the academic positions, which is similar to the jobs that you see the UK. And you can filter these to fit into your own area and basically see positions that uh, fit into your profile uh, within the area that you're interested in. And UKRI has some um, positions as well. The UKRI is the big part of research from the UK. They advertise postdoctoral fellowships and positions as well, among other uh, companies and industries that advertise fellowships. And uh, the university website is uh, always where to go to. If you're beginning to know the research groups that do things you want, the universities where they are, keep checking their uh, website for career and job postings. And uh, at some point, things might pop out there. And then again, referrals. You know, cold emails and referrals. It's mostly the UK professors or uh, lecturers, senior lecturers who have positions, but essentially still funnel back, uh, cycle back to their uh, networks to explore people who have the things that you're interested in, uh, in a way that they can be more confident with the recruitment process. It, it, it works greatly that way. So in the UK as well, there are different visa categories. Um, for this kind of position. It used to be called the TF4 worker visa or something like that, a skilled, now I think it's skilled worker visa, uh, which essentially comes with uh, opportunity to work uh, for I think three years in the first instance, and it can be extended to five years after which you can apply for a permanent residency. Um, it's similar also to the global talent visa. You have a PhD, you're a global promising talent, and you can convince the UK that you are uh, essentially uh, a talent that they can keep that would contribute to the UK economy as, uh, excellently. You don't even need a postdoc position or any work position to apply for that global talent visa. Uh, the US has an equivalent uh, of that kind of visa called the, the National Interest Waiver uh, Green Card Application Visa as well. So essentially you have a PhD, you have publications, citations, you can prove that your work is uh, great and, and, and uh, promising. Uh, and then you can get some recommendation letters from institutions and people that can vouch for what you do. Uh, the UK, the US, they're willing to take you in, even without a job offer. 
But some people also do that after their PhD uh, within those countries and they, they get into postdoc positions uh, with that visa. And again, there's family considerations wherever you're going to, to move on to. The, the UK is quite a small country in terms of size relatively. And um, the, the, it hard, comes with its own different kind of nuances. Um, so I moved from the UK to the US and part of what I noticed was uh, issues of space. The UK is quite small, so a lot of things are small in that sense. Um, but again, it's good in terms of transportation. You almost don't need a car for your stay in the, U in the UK. But moving on to the US, uh, in some parts of the US, especially the part where I am, you almost need a car to survive a great deal around. Uh, and uh, kids, your spouses kind of work. In the UK, for instance, dependent visa, as opposed to the US, the dependent visa in the UK gives lots of freedom to the spouse. They can do any work. They can uh, they can even start a company. They are, they are one of the most powerful visas, the dependent visa, uh, very unrestricted. In the US, that visa is the most restricted. You almost cannot do anything at all until you change status by some kind of um, uh, process that might be longer or shorter, depending on um, who is involved and what uh, next step they are taking. And so uh, it's also good to consider prospects after the postdocs while in the UK. Uh, for me, the postdoc I was doing uh, didn't quite have that much prospect afterwards, especially in the lab where I was. There were people who were doing things like that already, even though there were advertisements for permanent positions. It just felt like I wouldn't be contributing anything external or, or great, uh, different from what they were already doing. And so I had to look elsewhere. I looked at some other UK institutions and uh, didn't quite find the best fit until this US institution. And I applied all the way from the UK to, to this place uh, and moved in for that. And the postdoc I got here had a prospect tied to it. And that's why I also accepted it. So a couple of things to think about during the exploration process is, you know, what are the post prospects that I would get? Is it a two year program uh, postdoc? Is it four years? How long is it for? And at the end of it, how much skill sets or you know things i would have gotten and this is a consideration both ways not just in the uk but also in the us uh, and finally living in the uk uh, again like i mentioned it's a bit different from other places everywhere is different essentially so it'll be good to understand what happens in those places uh, from the outside speak to people who are already there uh, and see how it fits with what you want. Some places are colder or warmer. Of course, there's uh, global climate change challenges making things uh, upside down at this point in different places. But essentially, it's still good to know if you don't want to stay in temperatures that are a bit too cold or a bit too warm, uh, it's really good to know. It might become a very big issue. It sounds neglig negligible at this point, but it might become a big issue ultimately, especially when it tampers with your mental health. You know, I stayed in Scotland, which was, uh, a great place, you know, culturally, uh, the scenery, the landscape, awesome. But the weather in Glasgow, especially, uh, was quite gloomy and could get depressing, especially in the winters when you have a very short amount of daylight. Uh, you rarely see the sunshine in the most part of the year and so on. It's still changing now, I hear, but, uh, you know, it wasn't quite great in that sense. Other part might be fine. And then you think of these trade-offs of um, what you are willing to take and, and what you're willing to, to live with. So I'll just conclude with this slide, still emphasizing the, the need for referrals. And um, putting it all together here to say the referrals I mean come from all of these kind of processes. You know, you want just to get someone to know you or to know someone who knows you uh, such that you're connected, you're linked, there's a network. And then it's easier. I saw a Nigerian movie at one point, and the guy was trying to prove to the other person why things like referrals and, and networks work a great deal. And you know, he called his friend and said, take this money and go give it to anybody you know. And the guy went out, looked around, people were moving, but uh, he didn't find who to give it to. He came back and said, you know, it's difficult what you're asking me to do. And he said, go, go give it to anyone. There are people moving, I just give it to anyone. And the guy went again and just couldn't hand it over to anyone until he saw someone who was familiar to him. And he felt, okay, I'll just give it to this person then. And then he handed over the money. And then the, the point was made. And the point is this, most people are comfortable working with people they are familiar with or people who are within their network or extended networks who are referred to them by someone. This is also why you have referee letters in most applications is to get a, an idea of who this person is beyond what they're presenting 
in their uh, prof profile and application or in the interviews. We want to see how this person behaves day to day. Is, does it fit with the kind of um, uh, personality we want to have around us and things like that? So it's much easier if someone says, oh, I know this guy, I work with him, or I know someone who knows him, then they're more comfortable with accepting that uh, somehow within their, their space. Uh, but that doesn't negate the idea of applying through uh, the general application links and all that. It's very also essential. A lot of people get the positions through that. Uh, but while you're doing your PhD, while you're looking forward to having a postdoc or even faculty positions and all of that later, it's good to get into collaborations with uh, other people, contribute to people's work, um, have conversations at conferences, get to be known, you know, establish yourself also because you're trying to grow into research, uh, seize all the opportunities you'd have to introduce yourself to people and talk about what you do and link yourself to people they might know and, you know, essentially get yourself into their spaces so they can uh, remember you and have you in their minds as they as things go on you'd never know where everyone ends up later on uh, and then your advisor your phd supervisor has his own networks and links and connections uh, they would introduce you to those people they want you also to know them because you know your success after the phd is the success of your professor as well and so uh, cashing on those opportunities don't go be the lab mad scientist that doesn't um, relate with people, not social, not uh, jovial, that's not great for job life afterwards. And get into professional associations, even student associations, uh, and, and basically be active. Uh, explore those opportunities to, to get some linkages to you know, some networks that could be helpful. In some cases, the, the top is also empty. You know, there's people looking for people, uh, but they don't find them, and then, other people are elsewhere feeling like uh, there are no positions, it's difficult to get somewhere. But well, you get in some of these professional organizations and you, they get excited seeing younger people coming in and trying to take up positions and you get known and you begin to make a name from there. And then the older ones, uh, it, it's easier for them to you know, write referral, write uh, uh, recommendations for you. And those are very valuable. Send code emails to, to professors. Of course, uh, growing in academia, you begin to realize that uh, you have to get used to lots of rejections. You know, in applying for your PhD, it was the same. So don't be afraid of having rejections from code emails, but send them out anyways. You don't know who might be recruiting, who is looking for someone, who wants to just see something, and they might still respond to it. And that might be a way of building network as well. I did send a code email at one point to a professor in Canada. And the idea was I wanted to apply for a postdoc fellowship a Banting Fellowship in Canada, and I wanted to do it in their lab. And that was where the relationship started from. And we, we're still having a very great um, um, collaboration going on even till today, even though that fellowship didn't work out. You know, so, and also uh, bank on your colleagues a great deal. While you're doing your PhD, everyone there is a potential faculty. Everyone there is a potential uh, uh, leader tomorrow. And so it's great to have good relationships all uh, across. And dear, networks the extended network becomes your network as well because you know you could get referrals from them to a whole to unlock a whole lot of other people i think i will be wrapping up now i probably have taken more than enough time uh, but yeah just to mention here that uh, there are these two postdoc opportunities i want to plug in here for those who might be interested uh, these have been open for a while i don't i as i said uh, last week the professor hadn't gotten the person yet so if you've done some work in uh, Things related to microbially induced calcium carbonate precipitation for ground improvement. This is people in geotechnical engineering or soil engineering, essentially. You might want to shoot an email to uh, Dr. Sumi Sidika. She's an associate professor at the University of British Columbia. She's still looking for a postdoc. And this is basically ba uh, fully by referrals. Okay, There's no job advert out there. But she needs someone uh, desperately to take leadership in her group for this area of research. And very soon, we'll be putting out an advert for postdoc at Durham University in the UK. Uh, we're looking for someone to work on, uh, uh, okay, the idea is not here, work on fungi and biopolymers for soil improvement. Uh, we've got a small funding. It's just for one year, but of course, that could be, it could be a launch pad to other things. Working with my friend and colleague, Dr. Shravan Maguda, he's at Durham University, and the person has a short opportunity to come also to ASU for a couple of months within the period uh, of, the, of the postdoc. And so these are coming from essentially referrals, word of mouth uh, within the networks and things like that. So that happens a great deal. But also the job adverts would pop out 
uh, and people will be sieving through looking for people they know first of all people, of course you have to be qualified for sure um, but then the second layer of filtering might come to that point and so i i cannot overemphasize the need for those kind of networks and of course uh, continuous application in the other pathways as well and with that i want to thank you very much for your patience i hope everyone is not asleep yet because i just couldn't see myself <laughs> or see anyone while talking but uh, i hope you get one or two things out of this and i also hope that we have uh, some time for uh, interactions if possible thank you very much uh, thank you so much sir for the uh, presentation it was a uh, very insightful and uh, direct and uh, it was a uh, very very interesting thank you so much thank so uh, i would rather say that uh, it's still not nine time for most of the scholars here so oh yes that's still... true. <laughs> that's that's so, then 10 pm is still i see we are still just waking up oh, so, thank right. you. <laughs> so thank you sir. yeah exactly so thank you so much i really uh, gained a lot personally from the uh, talk and I hope a lot of uh, scholars also did. And uh, we, I don't know if we have uh, many questions, but uh, it was the request of a uh, doctor that uh, the, we make this more interactive. So, and that can only get done by asking questions and having some comments. But uh, also, we would also be looking at the time because we still have another presentation coming on. So, but I would want to give a chance for like uh, two or three questions and comments. I've seen some scholars here who are, I know would have one thing to say or the other regarding post-talk. And uh, personally, uh, I wanted to ask some questions, but you've helped me to put it into perspective. Regarding, I wanted to ask the fact that between UK and the uh, US, you know, one of the main concerns, you mentioned it, is the JAPA, JAPA issue. So, and uh, as we are migrating to other places, we also want a better life for our spouses. So, between your current position in the US and your previous position in the UK, like, was it convenient for you to, as a family man, that your spouse would be able to walk or your present situation now is it comparable to how it was in the uk in terms of uh, the working situation for your spouse so <laughs> good question um no it's not comparable it's it's polar opposites idea wow. you know, in the real sense of it so like i said in the uk uh, the dependent visa anyone on a dependent visa is really powerful you can do literally anything they can look for jobs, uh, different level of skill. Uh, they can start a company of their own. They can, they're very unrestricted in that sense. Of course, um, focusing on other laws and policies, but essentially they can do a lot more. But in the US, uh, any of those visas are listed there. Um, essentially, your spouse is automatically unable to work like at all. They can't start doing any job, even if they are a nurse with qualifications and license, um, they wouldn't be able to start until they change the status from that visa. It's uh, for 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 the students, I, I can't recall what the visa is called, but it's a student dependent visa. For the visiting exchange researcher, it's the dependent visa, the spouse. For the H-1B, it's the H-4 visa for the dependent. They are not allowed to work. So um, then, for the H-1B, which is a dual intent, which is more like you can apply for permanent residency. Once you put in the application for the permanent residency and the uh, process has passed through a couple of stages, then you are able to apply for uh, an employment authorization document, which would now help the spouse to be able to seek employment. Or the spouse can try to look for employment on the same H-1B visa and switch from being dependent to have their own work visa by themselves um, over there in that sense. So it takes a lot of more, some more processes. And for Indians, especially who've been here for many years, many of your spouses, uh, it's quite frustrating, frustrating process to, to do that. But in the UK, straight up, the spouse becomes a very huge advantage uh, to, to help uh, life go on uh, with, with the original uh, person who owns the visa. So for me personally, it's similar. My, my spouse was actually studying while I was in the UK. 
completing the PhD and, and starting the postdoc. So she was on her own student visa. But essentially, if she was still dependent on my visa, she would have um, been able to do whatever work she wanted. And she completed her studies at the point I was mo we moved to the US. And so you have a qualified nurse. And in the US, they said they need nurses. And uh, we're trying to go through the licensing process, but she's on my depend, my depend dependent on my visa and can't begin to work at all. She has a qualification in other areas, uh, masters in textile design, for instance, but she can't go uh, seeking for jobs based on just that visa. So I need to start up some processes and push it really far for her to be able to get there. I also need to, uh, or she needs to also push on a little bit, get the license, get to a nursing agency, get them to start the work stuff for her and all of that. So essentially there's a break, a huge break in being able to, to get established in that form. So that part is very gray area, but ultimately, you know, when you spring up and overcome this hurdle, it's possible that you have better prospects in the US. I didn't mention salary, for instance. The pay is generally higher in the US for, for postdocs. Um, the minimum pay that is required to bring someone on something like a H-1B visa in the US, it's open, it's in public domain, I think it's 60, 60K, $60,000. That's essentially what the person starts getting. Uh, in the UK, postdocs are within 32 to 34 or 38, thousand pounds uh, salary per year and so it's a bit of uh, a huge difference especially depending on the area of the u.s you go to so living costs vary across the states the u.s is so huge every state is like a country on its own in terms of <laughs> all of these different factors but the general visa rule is across the country but in terms of uh, living costs it varies widely uh, i hope that helps with the questions I don't talk too well much. thank you so much uh, uh the our president just mentioned the fact that uh, like us like korea because we have similar situations here in korea too. right okay so yeah it's uh... <laughs> so thank you so much for that uh, beautiful answer i think most of your presentation is self-explanatory and it's so simple and one question that I've, I've asked because i cannot see anybody asking any questions so that gives me a little <laughs> bit of freedom is the yeah. fact that how about the taxation uh, regarding the in both countries? I know UK doesn't play with tax, and I know US is also very notorious when it comes to tax evasion and the likes. So, what are your experience over? Okay, we have one. Somebody wants to ask a question, so probably after the okay. Okay, okay. Uh, let me give let me give him the opportunity to answer that ask the question so that. Maybe uh, a doctor can ans answer the questions together. So, Hamza, over to you, sir. Yeah, um, thank you, Ashraf, and thank you um, to the guest speaker for the insightful um, presentation. So, I actually wanted to ask a question with respect to the, I don't know, is it H-1B visa or the visa that is being given to those that are working? So, you know, there's definitely transition period when you have a work and then maybe you, you're in between jobs. Maybe you've worked for like two years and then you probably um, want to change job. Maybe you resigned or you got sacked, right? So, um, I was uh, someone was telling me that um, you actually have maybe two months or three months before you get another job or else you are out of U.S how how true is that and then how do you um try to um is there other ways for you to maneuver those kind of challenges because you know mm -hmm. uh, downsizing is something that happens everywhere so yep. for someone like um, a skilled person especially in tech now so and then you find yourself in us and you walk in and then maybe after six months or something you have a three years visa for instance and then after six months the company is folding up or maybe you've been sacked or you feel like oh you don't need this job you just need to sit on your own and then decide to resign so how does that work like yeah how we can just that particular visa or other visas thank you awesome yeah thank you again good question so yeah I i'll take this one first before i, I get to fajimi's question um yeah these things happen a lot and even recently it happened really massively where the tech industry dropped uh, lots of people. Uh, I think you have 60 days, two months, uh, I believe, or probably 90 days, but you know, it's within that two to three months uh, that you said, after you lose your job or something happens uh, to get something else. Uh, and that's a very short time. 
Uh, but then, like I said, there are there are lots of job opportunities in the in the U.S. Okay, it depends a lot on which of these people are willing to take you in, and continue the sponsorship of that visa. So if you're leaving one position, ideally you should have prepared with the other position uh, so that they can transfer easily from one to the other and then there's a seamless transfer. But if you're fired uh, or some other things happen like that, uh, then you have that uh, limited window to get something. A couple of people do get something within that period because you know they're coming from a place of experience uh, and probably if you're needed greatly in the system, you already know and have some networks. You have an idea where to go looking for the next level. So that might work. But of course, you can depend on that 100%. Uh, Canada recently opened a visa pathway. This was last month. Where people who already have H-1B in the US and are in that kind of position do not even need to do too much paperwork. They, they, Canada is ready to take them in straight up. And then they can start looking for something to do there. Uh, Canada are literally visa... ready to take in everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're very open to that. But well, what what to do there? I don't know how that part goes. But even that visa, um, within a few hours of opening the portal, I hear it, it really got jammed because there were lots of people <laughs> who were funneling in there uh, for that position. I, I, I think our next speaker, I would have to speak more on that too. All right. And that yeah, part okay. of Canada. So, yes, yeah, so that's Canada <laughs> side. Uh, so inside here. Uh, the best is just to still hopefully have something before that kind of situation happens. People in industry know that they keep job hopping, so they usually have some good backup plan in that sense. Uh, but also with a H-1B visa, as soon as you get it, as soon as you arrive in the country, you are qualified to apply for the green card. So with that employer, you want to start immediately that process of applying for uh, the green card before you get into those kind of situations. For some other countries, I think India inclusive uh, and some other uh, citizens uh, of other countries, they, there's a long waiting period for that whole process. And that's why they usually just keep renewing the H-1B where they have the opportunity instead of going through the green card process. But for us Nigerians uh, and some other countries around the world, the, the waiting period is not very uh, long and you can basically get into the process almost immediately. So if you're coming on a H-1B visa, the best thing is to do it is to go straight into trying to apply for uh, the green card the process. Green card. Then there is also the national interest waiver, which you have a PhD or a higher qualification. You can get recommendation data from top people in your field who know you, who you've worked with or who you've not worked with. And they can attest to the fact that you're needed in the U.S. And then you can fulfill all some other uh, documents and, and uh, notes and arrangements. You can immediately apply, even from outside the US, to say, okay, uh, forget about the job. I don't have a job offer. I don't even need one. I skip that labor requirement. Give me the green card and I will contribute to the US economy and things like that. So that option is also there uh, that people can explore. So those are some of those uh, pathways that are, that are possible. Uh, it's one of the best we started coming to the US with the H-1B, it's, a, it's a, like a golden ticket, essentially, compared to the other visas, which there might be some loops here and there before you move into, into that stage. And I hope that does justice to your question. And back to the uh, moderator's question on the tax situation in both countries. Um, so yeah, people feel or not feel, it's probably there. In the UK, as you go higher, your pay looks like it's smaller. The position is big. Uh, but the tax uh, amount widens as the, the pay bracket goes higher. So you see some people actually staying in a lower position, just somewhere at that sweet spot where they are taking something <laughs> reasonable and if they go a bit higher, it doesn't make that much difference. Uh, that happens a lot in the UK uh, from what I've seen. And in the US, it's essentially uh, open, open, open top. You know, you, you really keep going that way. The tax is not... There are taxes from state to state. Some states actually don't even charge, don't um, uh, apply any tax, uh, like uh, I think Alaska and some other states. Uh, and other ones, the tax is really, they keep it really low. There's a federal tax generally for everyone. But so ultimately comparing salaries uh, and how they are taxed between the UK and the US, you are correct in the sense that uh, in the UK, there's a lot more tax, especially as we go higher. There's a point where it actually becomes almost similar uh, with the US, but you know, it's usually more pay in the US compared to the UK. And so it's also wise to select the states where you're moving into to understand how all of those dynamics come into play. Into play. You might be in California and earning $180,000 per year, 
and you're still almost be living like a pauper uh, compared to someone who is earning 32,000 pounds in the UK uh, because mm. of rent costs and some other issues like that. But you could also be in uh, places like, uh, uh, I don't know, Missouri or something, somewhere there, and you're, you're living in a castle for a very significant amount of money and your salary goes a long way. So that's a very huge consideration uh, for, for the US. The states it matters a lot where you're going into and kind of things that prevail around there. I hope that wow. helps. That's a sweet ending to a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much awesome. for being with us so far. I really appreciate. And on behalf of the Nigerian Citizen Association, our KNU chapter, we want to appreciate you for that wonderful presentation. We can't thank you enough. And this is, in fact, a very big community uh, uh, community project or community service develop community development service that you've <laughs> just rendered to uh, us all. We really appreciate that. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you for uh, we, me. Uh, yeah, we wish you to see more of you, uh, hopefully, <laughs> in the future. Thank Probably, you so yeah, thank much. You. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Yeah, sir. Yes, sir. Now, uh, we move on to the next uh, presentation, and which is uh, going to be on mining scholarship opportunities for graduate studies in Canada. Uh, the resource person has been with us right from the start of the first presentation. And is no other person than Mr. Okwaranti Samson Okikiola. Uh, he has been here with us. Uh, and we, uh, we appreciate your uh, patience and we appreciate you being with us from the beginning of the session. I would, uh, you can share your screen. Uh, and while you do that, I would like to introduce you to uh, our uh, uh, other participant here who do not know who you are so that we can familiarize uh, ourselves with familiarize them with you and uh, for those who do not know him i've introduced him and he's also an alumnus of the better by far university the university of Ilori. he graduated uh, with a second class upper uh, from the physics department so uh he has a master's degree from uh, Amadou Bello University, also from physics, and he has more than uh, six publication. He's an IEEE member and a PBEE scholar at Quebec. So, um, of course, we want to benefit from his wealth of knowledge of how he has understood the geography, the, the, the atmosphere of seeking admissions into Canada. And we want to hope and uh, we want to hope that today's session is going to be a lot of eye hope now for those who are participating in the gathering here tonight. So I don't know what time it is in Canada, but I'm very sure it is kind of around in the morning or something like that. So his, uh, his research is on the aging of equipment installed on eye lines and dielectric and electrical insulation society student member. So, uh, sorry, he's the research chair on the aging of equipment installed on eye lines, VIATH and Dielectric and Electrical Insulation Society student member. So <clears throat> I don't understand all those grammar. So maybe when he starts to speak, he's going to introduce more on that. But with that one aside, we want to know how we can also gain and explore the opportunities and mine, just like the topic comes mining scholarship opportunities not just one want to mine a lot of opportunities for graduate students especially for those who are in nigeria thank you so much and uh, you have the floor sir So you got, I think your audio is kind of frozen.
Uh, Mr. Samson, can you hear me? Probably there is a hiccup. Please, uh, our technical crew, please help us check what the problem is. We can't hear the speaker. As we are waiting for a hand, so hmm. no, no audio. We we can't hear you yet. Um, Modrito, I think there might be a problem with his uh, audio settings audio. from the computer, yeah. Yeah, not yet. We can't hear you yet. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay. I think uh, I'm using my laptop now, but my laptop is also not enabling, uh, allowing me to use the camera. It's showing camera failed uh okay pra how about sharing the screen yeah, is it okay. possible yeah i think it's possible to share the screen sorry can you see it yes yes oh, we can sorry. see the screen oh i'm sharing the sorry yeah i'm sharing the wrong one uh Sir, is he okay? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. And the audio is clear? Very, very clear. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, please, uh, to everyone, sorry for the aberration in logistics. I, uh, uh, it's, okay, I, I want to appreciate uh, the coordinator and uh, the committee of this, uh, wonderful uh, webinar is so nice to be here i'm so happy to be the one of the presenters and uh, uh based on what uh most of our presenters have said earlier it's uh, so insightful and i've also learned a lot of things in fact i've gotten several informations about the us about the uk it's so nice and uh, i really appreciate everyone's effort and uh you know, like the, the thing is, the way we mine scholarship opportunity in US, in UK, is still applicable and we can still use it for Canada. The same principle can still be used for Canada. But in essence, one of the things that I like to 
you know, when I'm discussing with people about getting scholarship opportunity, is that we should, whenever we're searching for scholarship opportunity, we should take it so seriously and be determined. And we should know that it can be done. Because, you know, sometimes searching for scholarship opportunity can be so frustrating. Sometimes you will send email to, you will send email to professors, you will not get feedback, you will not get a uh, response from them. So sometimes it's so annoying, it's so frustrating. But the thing is, there is time for everybody to get scholarship opportunity. One of the things that I believe is that we, you can have 10 people like in the same room seeking for scholarship opportunity. Everybody will get their scholarship at different time. But the joy is that I, uh, for me, I am so sure that if we keep on pushing, everybody will get. Everybody will get scholarship opportunity. We keep on pushing. So the, the, the thing is, what are we doing in the process of seeking for scholarship opportunity? So I'll be talking about uh, how to mine scholarship opportunity and where to get uh, some important information, uh, the strategy in talking to professors and uh, getting feedback from them. So uh, these are the outlines of what we'll be discussing about importance of scholarship opportunity for international students in Canada, education and career growth. So we're talking uh, to the, you know, strong tips for successful application. So I want us to believe that this can be done. You know, uh, we, most of us, we were also there, like when I was in Nigeria, sometimes I would see, oh, this person has gotten opportunity, this person has gotten opportunity, and we'd be like, oh God, when is my own turn? But like I said earlier, the joy of the thing is that when we keep on pushing, most of most of the people that we were together in Nigeria, most of them now are not in Nigeria anymore. So most of them are also, they have gotten their scholarship opportunity. But the, the truth is, we did not get it at the same time. So the self-belief that it can be done is so, so important. Now, what's most of uh, the importance of scholarship opportunity? especially for international students. You know, like, like uh, uh, our former presenter said, the Jaffa syndrome in Nigeria is so crazy. Everybody wants to leave the country. So getting a scholarship opportunity is so important because uh, <laughs> paying your, what is it called? Your tuition fee yourself in Canada, it is not cheap it is not cheap it is not cheap so it is so expensive it is so expensive so it's better for us to get a scholarship opportunity because tuition fee is very expensive for international students and uh, one of the things that i i i have seen here over time is that when you get a scholarship opportunity and you're working with your professor there is there is like i can say there is a chance for you for example, those people working with uh, industrial research, if your work is more of industrial base, if you, if, if you are determined that, okay, the, I love to work in this industry, and you put all your effort as a PhD student or a master student, your professor can recommend you to the industry. Do you, uh, I believe we understand what I'm saying. Your professor can easily recommend you to the industry that, oh, this guy is so good, you can keep him, you know, I've seen I've seen cases, several cases like that, that the professor would just say, okay, this guy is a good guy, please. Uh, he's going to work so hard and he's very hardworking, dedicated. And your professor, you will, after your program, your professor will, will recommend it. So it's so good. But, you know, because I want to leave uh, Nigeria, I want to come to Canada and I go for, okay, I will, I will sponsor myself. It is not easy. If your attention will be divided, you'll be trying to meet up with your uh, tuition fee and trying to pay your house rent uh, it is i've seen people like that here but to be sincere it is so difficult so i would not advise anybody to although if if you know that uh uh 
we, we all know our you know financial stability and our financial status if you know that coming here to work and balance your tuition fee that's the plan i, I would just advise that it's better for you to keep on pushing for scholarship opportunity because it's not easy to to do self-sponsor and like i said for your career opportunity it will so happy because even among the phd students those that are not with the uh, like under scholarship the professor doesn't even give more attention to them they are they are always focused on their research student so why canada uh you know canada is is so sweet canada is so sweet canada is so sweet and uh canada is one of the i think uh popular destination we know everybody like canada why do people like canada is because of the flexibility you know uh when you graduate from a, a canadian university uh you can easily you know apply for postgraduate work permit you are entitled to ap apply for uh postgraduate work permit if your uh, your your program is more than six months or like six months or eight months even if it is diploma but if it is more than six eight months or so or six months you can apply for postgraduate work permit and during this time the postgraduate work permit is it's equivalent to the amount of years you spend during your program for example if you do your phd for three years you can be given three years of postgraduate work permit and if you have one year of job experience of, uh, of work experience rather you can apply for your permanent uh residency in canada so after your graduation you apply for your postgraduate work permit you can easily apply after one year of your work experience you can easily apply for uh permanent uh, pm you can easily apply for your permanent residency so and uh canada is very cold like i think like we all know canada is very cold sometimes it will be minus 40 and uh if you're someone that uh like to you know uh visit people go around it would be so depressing when i came here it was difficult for me i like i came uh january and it was very cold around uh, minus 30 from the airport i have to carry my bag put it in my head jjc you know i was <laughs> i was just looking around oh my god i was trying to look at you know every, everywhere was just white and the ground everywhere was just full with snow you don't even know you know it was so difficult and but the thing is with determination we can achieve it it's very cold in canada but uh for a nigerian <laughs> i think <laughs> the code is what we can all withstand you know so uh the, when you even whenever you arrive to canada you will have to you will need people you know that will have to especially if you come during the winter you will have to see people that you know have to meet people that will show you places like i think it's like that for other countries too but you know if you come during the winter where it is cold you cannot go out you cannot walk around because it, it, it is not immediately you enter canada you maybe have access to a car you have to you know settle down first and uh you know getting food getting stuff so you have to meet people that will take you around because even if you don't have a if you don't have a car it's so difficult when i came i went out and under five minutes my i was not feeling my hands anymore because it was around minus 35 and i just i came from my with my jacket from nigeria and i was outside for like five minutes i nearly you know lost my my fingers because of the coat so but you know it will be so you will not turn to a baby you you, you have to look for somebody that will take you to places and show you things like you know it's so frustrating and but with time we you you will get over it because it's normal and actually the people in canada they are so nice and they are very nice they are kind people they are always ready to help if you have any anything you need them to do for you even if you want to relocate i have experience of my uh somebody that said oh the person just met me and i said oh, you want to pack your things and you know they are ready to help anytime anytime any day 
So, and you know, like Canada is bilingual, we have the part of French and the part of uh, English. So, more, especially like Quebec, in Quebec, it is every activities are done in, you know, process in French, both in university and and uh, offices and everything, it's usually in French, but as if, you know, uh, for my own, like from my own side, they are so, so good people to stay with. No pressure, no intimidation, nothing, zero tolerance for any form of intimidation or something. So it's so, so nice. So there are several types of scholarship opportunity in Canada, which is like the same for, I can say for other countries too. We have scholarships that are sponsored by government. We have the one from the university and private scholarship, especially from the industries. We have so many private industries here that they were just, uh, you know, they have their research professor that they talk to from the university. We have this opportunity and we are looking for students. Like for government scholarship, we have Banting, uh, uh, postdoctoral fellowship, for example, it is still on now and it is around, I think it's around uh, 75,000 Canadian dollars per year. It is so good. Uh, Venia Canada scholarship is a, is a Canada, it is a Canada scholarship, it's a very good scholarship also, and it is a uh, $50,000, $50,000 uh, for PhD students every year. And uh, we have several provi provincial scholarship also. For example, in Quebec, we have PBEEE. Before they, uh, they call it FRKNT or PBEEE. It's uh, a scholarship in Quebec. It's, uh, it's so good, and uh, the financial support is so huge, also. And they give you uh, health insurance, and you know, so many uh, uh, stuffs come along with it. And if for university, most of the time, to get a university-based scholarship, especially in Canada, uh, the, the basis is all, is to get uh, a professor. It's so important because I've seen a situation where some uh, someone uh, uh, admission was about to be, you know, to be rejected because the person that doesn't put the name of the professor is that is going to, because they don't want to take student that will just come and be stranded and you no know direction you understand so the uh the admission office they will they would like to be sure that okay this guy is going to work with this social professor and they will send your admission form the templates everything to the professor and the professor we have to approve it that okay i told him or i told her to apply for the admission he, he or she is my student do you understand and the same thing goes with a uh, private scholarship also most of the industries they give it out the, the, the funding to the professors is a professor that will look for students. So these are some of the available uh, scholarships in, in, in Canada. Now, the, the important thing based on the topic of this uh, presentation is uh, scholarship search. How do we search for scholarship? You know, like we have uh, most of our particip participants, especially from Nigeria. My, uh, my, my own candid advice on how what I would say on on how to apply a set for scholarship is, for example, for people doing prayer masters presently in Nigeria, in during our do, uh, during our literature review, we we read a lot of articles, a lot of publications, you know, conferences from so many professors, which it which is in line with our research. So why? In, on the process of doing our masters, we can notice the profile of some people we may like. Okay, for example, I can notice some like ten people that I know that okay, these people I can I can I can meet them and show my interest in working with them. So you can get more information. Why that, that you know I I did something like that during my masters. I I I check. I know some people's names. You know by writing literature review, you know, by writing articles, with the people you cite, you know, and the people you cite, they see, they also see your publication. So it's, you know, it's so sweet when you can just make them, okay, I'm such a person, I'm working in this field. I wrote this article, this, you know, something like that. You can easily get in touch with them. So why doing our masters, we should, 
we should notice the, the set of professors we want to mail. Do you understand? So we should set a goal, okay, that these people that want to, I want to target them and this is for general uh, application, not only peculiar to, to, to Canada. But uh, the university website is so important. For example, we have, uh, you know, we have so many uh, universities in Quebec and there's a, we have an institute here, for example, INRS, if you go to their website, in INRS, if you go to their website, they will show you the list of professors and professors seeking for students. So we can visit some of these. Uh, we have so many universities in Canada, like we all know. So we can go to their website, like the list of staffs. You will see professors looking or seeking for students. And we can easily go to a field of study, maybe in electrical engineering. You can easily go there and see professors that is working in line or that, that specialize in, in your area of interest. So you can easily make this kind of, instead of sending mail at random, you know, we can easily make this set of professors because, okay, for example, I mean, I, I have my master's in statistics and I see so many, several professors in statistics, biostatistics and all this stuff. I can easily, you know, mail this set of professors and saying, okay, this is my uh, CV. This is my uh, uh, achievement. You know, we can easily get opportunity from this set of professors. And uh, we, you know, and another thing is the mailing professors. Most of the professors are so busy. You know, when I was in Nigeria, when I whenever we send professor a message to, and you don't, you, they don't even reply. If, you will be feeling, ah, oh, I, I don't get response. Ah, the problem is that the professor will not respond. If you write a lot of things, they will not, they will not. Professors receive several messages every day. They have their own academic career, you know, research proposal, so many things, so many things. Administrative, managing their funding, attending to students every day. So, it is so difficult for them to whenever they see a message that is not important at all this one is they will just most of them they will just 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 maybe delete it or just leave it so the thing is my advice whenever i want to send a mail to professor you know first for some people with uh publications i think it's easy i am you know it's easy to just write a short two 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 lines and you know i am social person i my research area is this i have a master's in this and if you want uh for you know for further something something you can just put your google scholar link it's easy i've seen it before i've seen students doing that i've seen a lot of people if you can just easily so with your google scholar link they can see whatever you have done in the past it's so easy and you can attach your CV for further information. You can just attach your CV. So if you check your Google Scholar account and you say, that, oh, this guy has experience. Oh, this guy is good. And you can just check your CV and check your other you know, leadership skills and if he's interested. So uh, I think after the acceptance of, mostly after the acceptance of, uh, uh, after you got acceptance from the professor, then the professor will ask you, you should go and apply for admission. Because applying for admission without professor uh, uh, authorization, it can be, I think it will be difficult even to get admission. It will be difficult. So, because based on, I, I've spent like one year and some months here, and I've seen, I've, you know, I've interacted with so many professors and I've seen a situation whereby the, the admission of the student is about to be rejected. When if in the letter of intent, it, the student did not, you know, he refused to put the, the name of the professor. And it was about to be, thank God that during the process, during the application, online application, the name of the professor appeared. But in the letter of intent, it, it was not properly stated. I don't know, something just happened and it was, I think that, that one was miraculous. Uh, he, he, it was not rejected eventually, but it, it is almost, 
it was almost rejected. Sorry. So we, I think we we should we should we should be you know we should make sure that we get uh, uh, professors before applying for admission, so so that we know with the application uh, fee. So after getting the professor applying for admission, most of the admission here, I think is not. I'm not sure there is any. Uh, I don't know, but I'm not sure there is any school giving. Uh, you you have to pay for admission fee. Yeah, have to pay for application fee. You have to pay, and most of the time it is not expensive. Do, when I applied for my own, it was thirty Canadian dollar. I think it was not much it was around uh, 11 or 12 thousand era then so it's not something expensive it's something affordable and after your admission you have to apply for study permit you have to apply for study permit for international student you have to apply for study permit and you have to, if you are coming to quebec you have to apply for caq caq is uh permit to study in quebec you have to apply for so after your admission you must apply for CAQ first, because if, if you do not apply for CAQ, the IRCC, which is uh, in, in charge of immigration, they will not approve your study permit if you are coming to study in Quebec. So you must, if you are coming to Quebec, you must apply for CAQ first before study permit. But for other provinces, you can apply, after your admission, you can apply for uh, study permit directly. So, so this, uh, the, from my side, disruptive for su successful application. Like I said, email to professors should be concise and not, you know, too, too, you should not write many things. You should not write many things. Just be brief and put whatever link that you have, maybe your research gate or maybe or Google Scholar, like I said earlier. And you know, drafting academic CV, it's so important. Uh, sorry to say, uh, academic CV of some people is, you, you know, you'll be surprised when you see it. Uh, you cannot use it, this is academic CV. You cannot use this kind of CV for academic CV. So the, most importantly, we should put, you know, uh, we should, put something like our academic experiences. These are the most important thing that they want to see. Your school and your CGPA, your research experience. You know, this should, these are important parameters to put there. So working on our academic CV also is important. And another thing, I think our previous, uh, our former uh, presenters, the uh, majority of them are mentioned about it that Connecting with current scholarship recipients is so, so important. Scholarship order, because, you know, uh, so, so some, some people that are very close to their professor, they hear complain of professors about some students, you know? Things like this, professor, some of the professors are so scared of taking any other students these days, because taking students that you don't even know uh, having a very good CGPA from undergraduate is not enough, so to say. It is really, really <laughs> uh, not enough. You will see some scholarship, for example, in, in, in Quebec, academic excellence is just 30%. Academic excellence in grading. I have some, uh, uh, some of uh, grading system for scholarship uh, application here. Academic excellence is just thirty percent. So having a good CGPA is good, is so good, is so good, but it is not enough. So because you know, so many factors, so many things can happen. Some people can come and with good and you know, due to the environment, some people can say, okay, uh, uh, the attention can be divided. Maybe working and in Canada, there's opportunity. Sorry, I forgot to say, if you get study permit you are entitled to work you have the opportunity to work in canada before it was 20 hours but now they have lifted it for i think almost one year now you, you have the uh, liberty to work as much as you can but 
you, you know, somebody must be uh, be careful so that it will not affect the academic uh, progress. So, you know, when people, some people, Imam being, we can easily change. Some people can come here and just uh, see the opportunity to work and making money and forget the goal. So anything can happen. People can change, you know. So most of the professors uh, believe recommendation, like, oh, uh, you can talk to, oh, I have a friend, he's so good, you know, I have uh, a brother, he's so good, I have a sister, he's so good, I have a, I have a colleague that is okay. By recommendation, I, most of, in my own lab, most of the people that are in my lab presently, they are by recommendation. Most of them are by recommendation. So, most of the professors now, they talk to their colleague, uh, they just, so if, even if they make adverts within their own cycle, they uh, we, by connection, you know, do you have anybody in this area? This, this, they get people by recommendation. So it's important to connect with current scholars. So you know, when we are applying, uh, like I said, why waiting for scholarship? We should not just because time is so important. We should not just you know be applying and be sleeping be applying and be sleeping. We should add value to ourselves. We should add value. It's so, so important. If it is, even if you don't have access to a laboratory in Nigeria, for example, or somebody can sit down and start writing a review article. I I, I can boldly say this, that even a review article, if, if you write a good review article, you can, you can, you know, you can, you can capture the mind of a professor that, oh, this guy, he, he, you know? So why waiting? We should not just sit and be applying and say, oh, I'm trying, I'm this, no. For writing a review article, you don't need any laboratory, you don't need any result. You can just sit down with a laptop and write a good and excellent review article. So why waiting? We should keep on pushing ourselves because research experience, especially based on my what i've seen here it's carried 40 percent 40 percent so like i said academic uh excellence 30 percent research experience 40 and research proposal what you are proposing also is 40 percent so it's important what the knowledge we are uh, you know uh gathering why waiting you know why applying is so is also important i have a friend that got you know while he was waiting, he was he was working so hard. Even at the, the university that he, uh, he, he was, you know, turned down, and the professor said, "No, no, 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 no." The professor eventually even <laughs> uh, took him as PhD student because he doesn't relent. He was working so hard. So when after like, six months and eight months, his CV was just boom and. The professor was like the same professor. So while waiting, we should keep on doing something very important that you know that add value to our academic uh, uh, career and 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 excellence. So uh, thank you for your attention, and I I believe that I have tried to cover some things, but. If we have any question, we can ask. And uh, uh, I'm so grateful for your attention. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, it's uh, uh, very, very insightful and as expected. And um, we want to appreciate your insights and uh, for the fact that you've gone through all the process of explaining and breaking the processes down to us. We uh, really appreciate uh, the uh, contributions. So. Uh, we would like to call on anyone who have 
one question or the other uh, to our resource person. So please, uh, you can indicate by muting yourself or raising up your hand in the group to ask the question on the, in the chat box or chat box or chat uh, area so that we can afford it to uh, present her. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I want to ask, before we were having more questions coming up, okay. I want to ask, um, you made mention of the fact that, uh, sorry. sorry. Okay. So you made mention of the fact that you made, you paid uh, a certain amount of application fee uh, while you are trying to apply. Does that apply for all applications for, for Canada graduates program? Okay, uh, thank you for your question. Like I said, you know, most of, uh, you, you know, we have different universities with, with their uh, application uh, processes and, but some, some university, uh, the application fee are not really expensive. Some are expensive. It depends on the number of, you know, applicants. But with my experience, for example, we have been Concordia University, Toronto University, some of these universities, you have to pay. That's just the truth. For postgraduate program, you have to pay for application process. So from most of the universities, you have to you have to pay for application process. And uh, like I said, it's not something uh, expensive. You know, it's not something expensive compared to some universities in United States and uh, in UK, you know. It's not really, you know, like, and also, sorry, the cost of living here is not really, you know, it's not really difficult to live here. It's not really difficult. It's flexible. It's so good. Like, it's so good. So for application, for uh, admission, uh, back to the question, you, you, most likely, you will, you will have to pay. Pay, yeah. okay. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Mr. Ayobami calls him Adibayo raised his hand. So if you can kindly unmute yourself to ask your question. And I have some questions from Mr. Olajide Shoyemi already. And the question is that, uh, is it necessary to have master's degree or publication before applying? And the second question is, how do one write a review article without being in the lab? That you should kindly expatiate, expatiate. Uh, the, the first question is, uh, is it necessary to have a to, master's degree ma master's. or publication before yeah. applying? Well, now is, is, uh, the application for PhD or for master's. So if you are applying for PhD scholarship, <clears throat> having master's is, is not like, for example, in Australia, in some university in US, you can apply directly for PhD, even with your uh, BSc, we have a good uh, CGP. But in Canada, it's, it's, uh, you have to have your master's. If you are coming for for PhD, you, you, you need to have your master's if you are coming for PhD. But, you know, I've, I've seen people with without a publication and they are doing their PhD program. They, you know, during their masters, during their masters, they, they, uh, did not have publication during their masters. But now the question is, how did they get the 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 scholarship opportunity for PhD? You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes giving something a try is so important. And like I said, connect connecting with uh present scholars is so important. This connection is so, so important. Connecting with our, our present scholars is so important. But to be sincere, if uh, <laughs> there is no publication, no strong uh, academic, uh, maybe like first class, you know, so to say, getting a direct PhD, is it might be challenging, even after your master's. Only if you're, because, what having a publication is what you need to show that you have a good experience for example the professors doesn't have time to be nurturing 
a master's to a master's holder you are coming for phd so they they prefer that okay i want i want somebody that already has experience like even if it is one article most of for with my own experience most of uh professors prefer even if it is one even if it is a conference do you understand they want somebody that they don't you know they will not be nurturing and you know trying to there is no time for like me when i even came like five months i did not see my professor so you will not see some professors it's just by email and they will just give you something you have to be working so for PhD, but for masters, you don't you don't really need any publication for masters if you are coming from BSc. Is uh, is <laughs> no, I'm I'm not sure the professor will not be expecting a publication from from a, a degree order. So most of the time, for PhD is you know it's highly competitive. So to set yourself at the top is so good. And secondly, writing a review article without uh, uh, going to the lab. It's not, for example, if you have a very good area of interest, if I want to work on energy storage, for example, using some materials, you can gather publications on, for example, on energy storage uh, devices, materials using enhancement of, you know, this thing. You can gather so many publications, read it. From what you read, you can get, you can have the direction. It's just about your own creativity. Okay, I want to direct my, my, own review article in this social platform, in this social area. Sorry. So it depends on uh, how to uh, how creative you are, your creative mind. You don't have to be in the lab. You just have to have. A, okay. For example, after your masters, you can say, okay, I want to work in uh, ele electric insulating materials, maybe liquid, liquid dielectric insulating materials, or solid dielectric insulating materials for high voltage. So you can just. You know, there are so many articles online. So during your course of reading, of course, you have to read. During your course of reading, you will see so many things, so many things to write your review article on. So I think uh, the, I think. Yeah, the, that, 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 that answers it. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Uh, Mr. Ayobami, uh, if you're still around, you can unmute yourself to ask your question. Thank you so much for your time. I so much appreciate the uh, presenter and the organizer. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I'm Hadibai Aban by name, sir. Um, sir, my first question is this. Actually, you've um, uh, answered some parts, but let me just come out straight. Um, I've been wanting to apply for scholarship, but one of the things in me, it's my um, first degree result. Actually, I didn't graduate with four or two one, either um, first class. So I graduated with two two. So actually that gives me pull, a lot of pullback. I feel like I'm just, it's just a waste of time. So now another thing is uh, a friend of mine do advise me. I do actually, I have a business in Nigeria and it's Alhamdulillah doing fine. So a friend, some friend of mine do advise me to go for masters in which I'm thinking of. But uh, now seeing you from your um, profile, I learned you, uh, you did your masters in Nigeria. So one of the things actually Stopping me from going for masters in Nigeria is this: I have a quite number of friends that I they are actually doing masters in Nigeria, and they spend more time. Some are still on it for like two to three years, and they'll be telling you they don't have a head with self. Do you understand? We saw that do give me concern. So please, what are your challenges you faced while doing your masters in Nigeria? So that's the one. So and number number two, my second question is this: yeah. Will that masters actually with what you said, um, publication and other things, will it help me get get um a scholarship um for master uh, PhD in Canada? And number three, it's like a, a um I have a um brother. He did I uh, he did his um PhD in physics just like you, but I don't know it's a niche. So I don't know if we can. I have I have is as he has been looking for a postdoc. For a while now, but it's not forthcoming. So actually, from what you said, he he might have be facing the same problem of what you said by not having a good refer or things like that. So I don't know. Since you are in the same field, I don't know if there's a tip you can just. Actually, it's not in, those, in this meeting, but I can actually feed him back. So those, those are my these are my questions. Thank you so much. Uh, 
thank you so much for asking these questions. You know, I really love when people ask questions. You know, I will start from the postdoc. You know, for uh, postdoc in Canada is uh, you first of all you will apply for we will call something like a closed work permit. Most of these uh, postdoc fellow they apply for. Uh, uh, closed work permits. So I want to, I don't mention it in my presentation. I'm using this opportunity to say that. And uh, if you have a, if you are coming for master's or PhD and you have a spouse, they call something spouse open work permits. Your wife can work anywhere, do anything at any time at, you know, that's a spouse open work permit. So for your, uh, for the postdoc, you know, if you check some postdoc adverts, even some, uh, the requirements, that some professors put for for postdoc uh postdoctoral fellowship if <laughs> if you have that kind of uh, uh requirement you are already a professor in another university <laughs> or associate professor or you just go and look for a job in industry we have a postdoctoral advert in my uh, uh, lab recently when i saw it i was like oh if if i have this kind of thing i will not come for postdoc I would just go for I would go to industry or apply for uh so uh, you know like the time of waiting like I said while we are, we are waiting there are so many things we should not underestimate or undermine importance of even if it is collaboration do you understand that is part of research connecting with people people get enough publication even by collaborating with their friends with the people with people around them so for postdoc you know the requirement sometimes is is somehow and you can also get it by recommendation but it's competitive you understand so uh, uh sometimes even we my professor sometimes i get uh some of the uh, message on my research gate like some people work looking for postdoctoral position you know mainly me like oh it's this position in your lab is it available, but it's not really, really uh, difficult, and it's not easy, so to say. So it, it's 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 so good if you, you can you know put on more effort and not not you know uh, not stopping is also part of it. You should keep on trying. I'm so sure it's going to get. Now, challenge is about ma doing masters in 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 Nigeria. You know, self determination is so important me i'm ad, I'm, I'm an advocate of self-determination just trust in yourself believe in yourself and choose wisely you know i i did my i did my what is it called my like you said my, like uh uh my, my bsc in university of learning and i i just decided to i went to zaria and it's in zaria it's so difficult you see, when I when I started my masters in my first month, I was seeing people saying three. Me that you know when you, when you come from University of Learning, that calendar is so unique, and you get to a place that they are saying masters is three years, four years. I was shocked. You understand? I was like, even ah, even learning that even during my time, I did not even experience any strike, and I will not come here and say masters. I will now use uh, three years. I was so depressed in my first four months. What is this? I was like, what is this? So I just tried to, you know, be determined that, okay, this thing, I will finish it in two years. Because you see people out of, you know, master student and you see people that finish also in two years, even some people in 18, 18 months. So self-determination is important. Just focus on yourself. Don't look about what people are saying go for what you want but it's important to set a goal you know like you said for me i did not have a first class but and i know that i'm going to the market to compete with people with first class so i have already determined that okay in this people with first class if we apply if we have the same if we don't have both our publication most of the professors will select people with first class of course even there are some universities that they choose first class students but you can only beat up when you have some profiles, excellent profiles. That's when you can withstand the pressure from other uh, first class students. So 
And based on your own condition, with Tutu, we have people with Tutu that are getting several opportunities. But why you were waiting? Why you are waiting right right now, rather? Why you are waiting for scholarship opportunity? What you are doing, like I said, is so important. Please, like it's so. I don't know if you understand. It's so important. If you know that you are looking for scholarship opportunity, trying to get things done at the right time, getting some, adding some values to yourself. Because you are, to be sincere, you are, you are going to the market to compete with others. So adding some values to yourself before going is so important. So, but I'm so sure that you will get. Just you will get. Like thank I'm just you so you, much. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for that wonderful answer. Uh, I think uh, one last question from uh, Mr. Abidin Tunde, so that we can call it a day and. Uh, uh, if uh, Mr. Faimi Brian can write out his question, probably we can see. Probably we can, the lecturer can okay, ask that together. together. So, Mr. Abidin, so today, Mr. Abidin ask today, please ask a question. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, we can't hear you again. Please, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you now. Yes, yes, we can hear okay, you now. I'm sorry, it's raining, it's raining at my side. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity again. Um, I would like to make my question very brief. Um, I'm, I'm a graduate of um, Lautech with a 2-1 in biochemistry, and um, uh, I, I specialize in uh, computational chemistry, and uh, I have some publications to back it up. And my question now is, since uh, you've explained to us earlier that having uh, BSc and uh, targeting PhD direct is going to be difficult in Canada, I would like to ask, with 2-1 and publication, do you think it's going to be uh, a competing profile for PhD or would you still suggest the person should go for master's first? That's my question, sir. Did you get the question, sir? Get the question, sir? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I, I got the question. I, 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 got the question. Right. I think uh, the microphone was a little bit far from him. And, uh, but the, my advice is, like I said, can, in Canada, it's better to have a master's. It's not like the US. It's better to have a master's before going for PhD. I'm not, I've not seen and I've not uh, heard about anybody getting uh phd phd directly from bsc the only thing that like for example in my like school, example, the only thing that is possible is, is possible is if you what is it called if you apply for bsc with a first class they will ask you a first class and one publication for example in my school you will start a master's for one year so if your academic transcript in that one year is good, it can be elevated to PhD. I, 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 don't, I don't know if you understand what I said. So Very clear. Yeah, so if you apply for, if, if you are a BSc order and you apply for a PhD with one publication, they will put, it, it will be master's, but after one year with a good CGPA, it can be upgraded to PhD. I think I have answered the question. So, okay. Um, the next question is that you made mention of the fact that some the application fee is low. So the question I asked that can you mention some of the schools with low application fee that he has been seeing? The one he has been seeing is about sixty to seventy dollars upward. Yeah, I think that's. But uh, <laughs> seventy dollars. Oh. I'm. Probably, maybe you would send the list later, and then we we'll share with them. Yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is that I think for seventy, I think it's not a uh, uh, because when I applied, it was thirty. When I applied, it was thirty dollars. And that was like two years ago. Yeah, that was uh, uh 2021. So it was thirty dollars. But now I think in my university now it's hundred dollars. So I think because of the rise in the, in stocks and and so, inflation and inflation. So I think that's the cost, but. Relatively compared to some universities in other countries, I think it's not, uh, that's what I said, it's not expensive, relatively. 
Okay. Okay. I think that answers that. So I I I I am of the opinion that there are other schools that are doing just like you said that uh, they have a free application. Uh, but it's not always available for all year round and for everybody. So I think that answers that question. So for the last question from uh, Miss, uh, I'm not sure, probably it's Miss or Miss, Mr. or Miss, uh, Peace Yanolua, is the question that after your undergraduate study and when applying for master scholarship, but your recent work or job you are doing is not related to your course, meaning that you don't have recent experience on your study, what will you do? I think you get the question sir because yeah. sometimes you ask from your previous experience so and if your previous experience is not correlating with your uh the role that you are aspiring for so what do you do in that aspect as regards canada application mm, yeah you know this uh one of the challenging things and for example if i understand the question very well if maybe you 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 are you are working on something or you do something on uh in your bsc that and you want to apply for your masters and what you want to apply for master is not in line with what you do in B, your bsc so for phd maybe for example for someone that you know uh do like nuclear physics in masters and want to switch to another aspect of physics you know it might not be challenging but the, the one of the problem is experience it depends on the you know it depends on the personality of the professor you are you are you are you are going for but mm. it's 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 will be a sometimes some professor will not even respond some professor will not respond to your mail because they know that you, there is, you don't have you don't really have experience in it the relevant, relevant experience the relevant experience. so it's it's good once you are as once you are determined that i want to i want to go for this it's better to add some values mm. you understand me I, for me with my own experience i did not i, I did not apply for any scholarship why i was uh i sometimes if i have made several professors and i don't get any response so i waited i decided that i will add value to myself first before, before applying before applying or before making any uh application or before doing anything so <laughs> it's important to add you know some some values in your area you know what you can add to yourself to make you stand out or to make <laughs> you qualify all right thank you uh, um another question comes that uh, what about admission into animal science do you have any information regarding that animal science yeah applying to animal science just like any uh any other application any other application you don't, you know, like we love you, like you've been saying uh it's better to have uh, uh you know package yourself very well mm. the way you package yourself is so important to, to the professors presenting yourself to to the professors is so important and even there are some uh some uh free or what is it called internship that you can go for like four months internship like working in a farm you know these are some of the things that yeah uh, it can add value to you to you for example those in animal science is these are some of the things that if you have experience in working and you can have, you have evidence that you can show that mm -hmm. you have work in this also place you have this as experience and I'm, I'm so sure that everybody will get their own opportunity i'm so sure all right thank you so much uh for the wonderful presentation and the beautiful remark before we end the session uh we would like to have a presentation of certificates and also the president of the national as nigerian student association kyungfuk national university chapter who also doubles as the president of the Nigeria Student Association in Korea and in Arabia and East is going to give his uh, closing remarks. So thank you so much everyone for being a part of the session right from day one and to the last day as we are having it today being the grand finale. It's a wonderful experience so far starting all the way from uh, uh, July 22nd We've talked about the graduate scholarship opportunity in the US. We've talked about that of Hong Kong. We've talked about that of Australia. We've talked about that of Japan. We've talked about how to forms of graduate student, st graduate study scholarship in UK. We've talked about that of France. We've talked about that of uh, South Korea. 
we've also talked about the varieties of opportunities in uh, Saudi Arabia. And now, today being the grand finale, we thank Almighty God for bringing us to the position where we are today. This is a wonderful opportunity that is available free of charge to all and sundry. We've been making this, we've made enough publicity, and we pray that may Almighty God reward everyone, everyone that has participated in making this outing a success. So thank you so much. I will now hand over the reign of the control of uh, this session to the president, Engineer Rabiu Anis. So thank you so much, Mr. President. Mr. President. Uh, just about to share the screen. Let's see this. Uh, just one more. So, uh, have this. Okay. Okay. Um. Good day, everyone. Good evening from good morning from South Korea, and uh, I think good morning from the United States and Canada. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to present this certificate of appreciation to our first speaker. I hope uh, the Dr. Emmanuel Salif is online. Um, on behalf of the entire uh, Nigerian Student Association, Pembroke National University, uh, we would like to present to you a certificate of appreciation for your contribution and commitment towards the um the webinar the scholarship webinar we had in 2023 is a great honor and pleasure to have you uh for this wonderful section i believe so much the section is so much insightful and there's so much information that has been uh passed across and i also believe that the section is well recorded and over the years people will make a uh, reference to this um presentation and i believe it will be beneficial to uh africans and uh, most especially our brothers and sisters back in nigeria this is just a way by which the nigerian state association Queen Book national university we are giving back to our own country and um through us you've also contributed your own part to the development and also a community service to uh, our brothers and sisters and also to ourselves thank you so much you so much appreciate your contribution thank you very 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 much uh here is a certificate from the association we hope you will accept this as a, a little token from us. Thank you very, very, very much. Um, secondly, uh, I will be proceeding to uh, the second speaker, a um, person of Dr. Um, uh, Mr. Oparati Samson Ukikiola for giving us wonderful insight about scholarship opportunity in Canada. I so, I'm so much aware, many Nigerians, they want to go to uh canada and uh as dr elia mentioned uh usa is a very hot spot for many nigerians and also canada is also a very wonderful place everyone would love to be and also as well as united united kingdom which the, the lecture series we have today covers those three um countries three three region and i believe uh, this section is so much also informative i learned so many things things i've never heard before about canada and i believe everyone who joined this section also learn one or two things it is uh with high sense of honor i would like to present this certificate to you certificate of appreciation on behalf of the entire um nigerian student association for being a part of this wonderful uh, scholarship sensitization program for this uh 2023 we so much appreciate your uh, contribution to the um community development through the nigerian student association thank you very very much it's a pleasure and an honor to have you we hope to see you in greater places in the future. It's my pleasure, sir. Um, also, uh, I was also being saddled with the responsibility to uh, bring this section to an end. Uh, sincerely, we've start, we started this section at about three weeks ago on the 22nd of uh, July, and it's been so rigorous. Uh, sincerely, uh, I, I will first appreciate the efforts of the um, committee that was started with this responsibility. Though no, as, as, as an association and as the head of the association, our home is just to look at what can we do? How can we support our people? How can we contribute to the um, to our society? We all know 
the challenges we face before many of us get here. And one of those ways we feel we can contribute back, uh, we can give back to our society is through this uh, mentorship and scholarship opportun opportunities program. And believe me, this year we've had it very, very rigorous, very long, very lengthy, very informative, and it's so beneficial to all of us. Uh, I would like to appreciate the organizing committee of this um, section, uh, who is uh, the committee is led by Engineer Abdul Yakin at ABC, who is the chairman, has worked tirelessly to make this section a successful one. We so much appreciate every member of this committee. Also, secondly, I would also like to appreciate the technical team. Be, for us to have this section, uh, to have an inch fridge section, it's also some guys behind the screen who are, who are typing, who are making sure that this section is covered by um, Google Meet and also as well on our YouTube, on our Twitter, on our Facebook, and also on LinkedIn. So we so much appreciate the effort of the technical team. Also, I also like to appreciate the effort of our moderator, Mr. Amsa, and also uh, Dr. Ashraf in the making. Thank you very much for making this um, for making this sense, um, scholarship program uh mind ca 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 captivating and not boring one thank you very much for putting sugar and honey into the section and mr Gwinga. and mr Gwinga. okay i missed that uh Solomon. and mr Solomon, thank you very much for making this section this year a wonderful one uh also to all pass uh, uh, participants we so much appreciate your presence and also for all the speakers right from the one from Dr. Kudrot uh, to the last speaker we had today. Uh, we so much appreciate all your contribution and um, you, uh, your support for our brothers and also to ourselves and to all Nigerians at large. Thank you very much. I pray that the Almighty God will reward every one of us abundantly. May Almighty God ease all our face. And lastly, before I go, I shouldn't, um, I should not forget to appreciate the effort of the committee, uh, sorry, the executive, NSC executive. They've tried so much to make this uh, program also um, possible for us in their deliberation and also their time and also as the, um, uh, the committee in charge of this program, we get back to the executive. We try as much as see how we can support the association. So much thank every one of us. To our advisor, we thank you so much for your unwavering support. And also, I, I, I would like to use this opportunity to appreciate the effort of our founding uh, member for their uh, fatherly advice and brotherly advice throughout uh, this program. Thank you very much, everyone. To all the people who have contributed to the success of this program, we say a big thank you. And I, I hope and also believe that the future is there is awaiting is awaiting to reward every one of us for our contribution towards the success of this program thank you very very much uh i believe this section is bring to an end and i hope that the similar program uh maybe in future or maybe in next year will be much more better than what we have this year thank you very much i still remain my humble self and it's thank you Thank you, Mr. President. And that officially brings us to the end of this year's Global Scholarship Opportunity Seminar and Webinar organized by the Nigerian Student Association, Cheongpuk National University, Daegu, South Korea. It's been a I'm pleasure. Sorry, having, having, <laughs> it's been a pleasure having every one of us here. So please spread the gospel, spread the message. There are some people in Korea doing wonders. So we love you and we wish you great in your future endeavor. Bye bye. Kamsa Amnida. Kamsa Amnida. <laughs>